Aber, also bei euch, die Foto macht, Bianca, die eigentlich für uns so den, den ganzen Abend über das Foto machen. Aber du kannst natürlich auch sehr gerne, wo du gerade hier dann, dass du gut bist. Guten Abend, guten Abend, good evening und ganz herzlich willkommen im Literaturhaus Zürich. Welcome at House of Literature on this beautiful and slightly hot evening in Zürich. <lacht> slightly. <lacht> Wir freuen uns sehr, dass heute Suki Svavana hier ist on stage. Welcome Suki Sva. Thank you very much. Edwin Schronet und Lola Schronin, uh, they will join us, uh, joining us via Zoom. Welcome, digital Hello. to Zürich. And uh, welcome Anna Sobral, also on stage. She will be the moderator of this evening. And we will be talking about a huge subject, uh, translating and publishing across the African continent. I'm looking very much forward to it. My name is Isabella von Landen. I'm mitverantwortlich for the program des Literaturhauses. And we, the Literaturhaus, are in the schönen Lage heute hauptsächlich auch freudig und gespannte Gastgeber zu sein. Es ist eine Kooperation äh, mit drei Partnern heute Abend, mit dem Übersetzerhaus Loren, mit der Stiftung Litta und mit dem Museum Strauhof. Und mit allen dreien arbeiten wir auch individuell schon länger zusammen. Und es ist schön, dass es jetzt auch diese größere Kooperation gibt. Und es gibt einen äh, Anlass ganz konkret, das ist die Ausstellung Lied Afrika, Poesien eines Kontinents, die vor kurzem im Strauhof Museum eröffnet worden ist. Und, äh, die Co-Kuratorin Christa Baumberger wird uns gleich mehr zu dieser Ausstellung und auch zum heutigen Abend erzählen. Ja, herzlich willkommen auch von meiner Seite ähm, zu diesem Abend. I'm the director of Lita Foundation and together with Remy Schacker, who is 
here tonight and is sitting just there. I'm the curator of the exhibition Litafrika, Portraits of a Continent, Poesien eines Continents. It is the first part of a series of three exhibitions shown at Strauhof Zürich from 2022 to 2024. The trilogy is called Litafrika and it's of course about the literatures of the African continent. You find more information about the exhibition in this invitation card here, which we will, you will find also when you leave the room. The next year exhibition of Lit Africa will be curated by Tsukiswa Wanner, who is the guest tonight, one of the three guests tonight. The main language tonight will be English, but the exhibition itself is very plurilingual. And the continent is extremely plurilingual. And when we met this week, when we met several times to Kriswa, she always told us, ah, it's such a pity that we only speak English all the time. There are other languages which play such an important role, French, for example, Portuguese. Alors, pour faire plaisir à Tsukiswa, Et Merci. comme nous avons une invitée qui vient de Côte d'Ivoire, Edwige René Dro, et qui est francophone et qui est en plus traductrice, je vais changer un tout petit peu quelques phrases seulement, je vais dire en français, pour glisser cette langue dans cette soirée. Mais j'ai surtout envie de vous lire le début d'un poème d'une poétesse ivoirienne qui s'appelle Tanella Boni. Et je vais vous lire aussi le poème, non seulement parce qu'il est en français, mais parce qu'un des buts principaux de notre exposition est de donner vraiment la parole, la voix aux poètes et aux poétesses elles-mêmes. Je vais donc vous lire les cinq premiers vers du poème qui s'appelle « La pluie a son mot à dire ».« Pourrais-tu lire le livre de ma peau, écrit en hiéroglyphe minuscule, le livre de ma peau de femme, toujours ouvert, à la page du temps qu'il fait ?» Voilà. Ich finde, das ist ein schönes Motto für diesen ganzen Abend, weil wir haben einen sehr weiblichen Abend hier. Alle Gäste sind Autorinnen, Verlegerinnen, Vermittlerinnen. Wir haben eine weibliche Autor äh, eine Moderatorin und sie werden eine sehr große Vielzahl an Büchern jetzt eben entdecken. Nicht nur Le Livre de Mappo, aber eben auch die, die Bücher, die sie lesen, die sie entdecken, die sie verbreiten über den ganzen Kontinent. Anna Sobrau moderiert den Abend und ich begrüße Sie hier ganz herzlich. Anna Sobrau ist ein Literary Scholar. Until 2021, she was Assistant Professor for Global Literatures at the University of Zurich. And now she works as a Program Manager for Literature for Artlink. Anna, ich übergebe dir das Wort. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this very hot evening. It's also nice that we take the time to go inside and talk about literature. And I'm very, very happy to be uh, talking tonight with three very productive and active women. And I will briefly introduce our three guests and then um, we will have a conversation where I'll just throw some questions and I think there will be a lot of space also for uh, Sukiswa and Edrich and Lola to ask each other questions wherever that's, that's appropriate and you see that you want to add something. So this is a, a conversation in many voices. I already know their answers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something that also um, I'm very curious about, how all three of you know each other, for which contexts we will get there. Let me just briefly introduce our guests, Asuki Swawana, who is here with us um, live at, um, or present in full 3D at uh, <laughs> Literaturhaus Zürich, is a writer, editor, publisher, and curator, as we now also heard. Uh, born in Zambia to a Zimbabwean mother and a South African father, raised in Zimbabwe and currently based in Kenya. Um, but uh, Sukizwa considers the whole African continent her home. Her debut novel uh, is called The Madams from 2006, and it was shortlisted for the 2007 Case Seloduka Award. Um, her third novel, Men of the South, 
2010, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize Best Book in 2011 and for the Herman Charles Bosman Award. In 2020, she was awarded a Goethe Medal alongside Ian McEwan and Elvira Espejo Aika, making Wana the first African woman to win the award. And congratulations for that, Sakisa. Thank you. Thank you. On your left-hand side on the screen, you see Edwige René Tro. She's a writer, a translator, a literary activist from Côte d'Ivoire, co-founder of the literature collective Abidjan Lit. And in 2014, Edwige was named as one of those chosen for the Africa 39 project. Uh, some of you might know it, uh, intended to showcase 39 promising young African writers under the age of 40. And she was also included in the anthology, which then came out of that, Africa 39, New Writing from Africa South of the Sahara. She was Pan International New Voices Award judge, and uh, she's a contributor to the tw 2019 anthology, New Daughters of Africa, an amazing, amazing book that was edited by Margaret Bubsby about this fat. And, and worth every page. And finally, Lola Shoyenein is a Nigerian poet and author here on the right-hand side for us on the screen. Lola has published three volumes of poetry. Um, in 2014, uh, she was also named on the Africa 39 list of 39 Sub-Saharan African writers aged under 40, like uh, Edwidge. And um, she won the Penn Award in America, as well as the Ken Sarawiwa Award for Prose in Nigeria. She was on the list for the Orange Prize in the UK for her debut novel, The Secret of Baba and I don't know, Segi's. The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives. Exactly, Wives in 2010, The Secret of Baba Segi's Wives. Uh, Lola lives in Lagos, Nigeria, where she runs the annual Ake Arts and Book Festival. So this is really heavyweight um, group of uh, women we have here with us today uh, to talk about literature across the African continent. And I will throw a first general question, and she's addressed to all of you. So I'd say one after the other, I would love to hear your opinions on, and let's start really general, what is for you the role of books nowadays? And I'm thinking of this against the background of all the statements we hear that uh, written literature is dying, nobody reads books, or ever less people buy printed books, everything is happening on the internet. Uh, we have a web-based youth culture around videos and TikTok and all these, these panics that we hear sometimes about the book dying. And I mean, Sukis, where you run a publishing company, Edwidge, you founded a public library, Lola, you run a publishing imprint and bookshop. How do you see the role of the book nowadays? And maybe we can start with Sukiswa, who is here. Can't we start with Edwidge? <laughs> <laughs> you start. <laughs> uh, it's it's a, it's an interesting question because um, you know during uh, lockdown one of the most interesting things was uh, a proliferation of like literature like people buying books mm. because people were tired and I'm talking about uh, from my perspective as a publisher where mm. I um, I couldn't keep up with print runs because people mm. wanted the books so I'm I'm I'm, I'm not sure really that um, you know. Of course, we also got it years ago that, oh, yeah, everybody's going online now, so people are buying e-books. But personally, I still like the traditional book, and I know a lot of people who really like, you know, the, the smell of it, the feel of it, to be able to, like, sit on a couch. And um, and, and that's uh, the reason why e-books, um, they're there, but, you know, they, they hit a top, and then they just mm -hmm. kind of, like... But but the books um, still continue. So um, the book is dead. Long live the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Edwidge. Uh, would you like to share your view? Well, as somebody as somebody who just set up a, a, a library two years ago, mm. obviously the book is not dead. It's a bit like that philosopher who said God is dead, and you know. 
we've uh, spent years and years uh, saying that, you know, well, he's not dead, or books are very much alive, and I think, like Sukiswa said, uh, sales of books actually did go up during the uh, pandemic. People were uh, ordering in books. I am talking, um, we had the Abidjan Book Fair on the uh, 18th of May um, this yeah, this year, and during the pandemic, um, in Senegal, for instance, there were many people who uh, began ordering books online because they wanted books to be delivered uh, at their house, because they wanted to entertain their kids, because they themselves uh, want, wanted to read. Uh, here in Cote d'Ivoire, you have new, a new generation of young people who are actually uh, getting into the book review um well job business so that means that they are reading the books so um well i do not know who is making this assertion but from this side <laughs> and from where i'm sitting the book is very much uh, alive, alive. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for that question and uh, thank you very much for for having us on this panel um in Lagos, Nigeria, West Africa, I would also say, agree with my sisters um, and say that the book is very much alive. Indeed, there was an uptick, um, an increase in sales, quite a sharp one during, during COVID. But I think something very interesting has been happening over the last 10 to 15 years. And that has come about simply as a result of people seeing um, the potential mm -hmm. of writing, the rights, the publishing industry, the, you know, the act of actually writing, being a pathway to being successful. Um, so there's that, but beyond that, I think having um, so many new festivals, um, with a spotlight on a lot of writers who themselves have become public speakers, mm -hmm. it means that people see books as um, the symbol of intellectualism. People see books, you know, as being quite sexy. <laughs> I mean, girls will say, you know, if I, I only love a guy if he's got a book in his hand and things like that, which has been very good for us. <laughs> in the book business. It has been very helpful. Long may books uh, continue to be sexy and long live the book. Thank you. Uh, having established this amazing celebration of the book, let me turn now specifically to uh, the markets in which you operate. Um, because what is also interesting about talking to the three of you is that you are all writing um, within and for uh, markets on the African continent. You have formed a series of initiatives about which I will talk more in detail, presenting some of them that I would actually also like to hear more about that are related to books within the African continent. And I would be interested in your experience, I mean, you have so much experience, all of you, have there been also significant changes in the literary market uh, on the African continent that you really noticed, aha, uh -huh, here, um, there are more festivals or there, there are more sales of, of specific types of books. I would really love to hear your different experiences on, on the level of the literary marketplace on the African continent. Uh Certainly, there, there, there have been more festivals. Uh, you've got uh, one of the biggest festivals I've been to is in Hargeisa, in, in Somaliland. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, of course, uh, Ake Festival is like the mecca for all of us uh, every year. There is uh, uh, Fed to Live in, uh, in, in uh, DR Congo. You know, there are uh, quite a number in, in, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, left, right and centre, there are quite a lot of festivals on sub-Saharan. Um, and w the other thing that has happened is I have seen a, 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 a large, like, you know, in, in, in Kenya alone, I think in the last, there've been like three, like three, three in one, in Nairobi, mm -hmm. like three, four bookstores mm -hmm. that have come up. And it's, it's interesting because initially there was this thing where, um, 
you know, uh, the biggest book buyers in South Africa were were middle class white women. So mm -hmm. publishers catch it to mm -hmm. that. Now the biggest book buyers are middle class black women uh, because they form book clubs and 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 once a month to get away from their husbands and children and whatever they go to a book club and then they drink wine they have writers there and stuff and they and they buy a lot of books mm -hmm. um uh we're all like in a in a group called book farm africa mm -hmm. which has uh writers and and publishers and bookstore owners and uh distributors from across the continent uh from lucifer from anglophone from francophone world and uh what's interesting about that is there is actually in that group there's a group that so people people show when they've like children's books when they have mm -hmm. published a new book but there's also very interesting in that group is that um there is um there's a there's an organization that does something called a book stock file. And so every year, um, every every month, people contribute mm. uh, some money. And then at the when it's the person's birthday month, then they get like a whole lot of their books on the wish list. And and it's beautiful because it's usually like books by writers from Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. Mm -hmm. So I certainly see like um, many more people buying, many more many more people uh, more bookstores. Um, many more people interested in the idea of uh, being publishers and many more people looking at things where, you know, for the longest time uh, they told us that fiction didn't sell yeah. and fiction is selling like crazy, you know. Fiction is selling more than nonfiction um, because what is more than fictious than fiction? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Edwidge? I love your quote, you poor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to add on to what uh, Zook said, uh, obvious another, uh, what we are noticing also um, here uh, in Cote d'Ivoire where I live, is that, uh, like you had mentioned, we, have, we are having books from um, other, you know, uh, African writers, um, obviously who are not, uh, you know, who are not Ivorian, Mm -hmm. um, the language that we have here a lot more it is English, but what is also interesting is that you know literary translation has become something that is uh, uh, talked about more. And since Lola was talking about sexiness of books earlier on, this is another topic that has become um, you know uh, sexy, interesting. Um, there are there are many very few uh, literary translators from Africa mm -hmm. who are actually you know translating each other's work. Mm -hmm. Publishers are you know more open uh, to be having uh, uh, the conversation around uh, you know uh, translation. And I think also you know the role of festivals that we have. So uh, they are inviting writers from different parts of um, you know of. Um, different African writers from different parts of the continent who speak, uh, who do not only just speak English. I know that, you know, at Ake, um, every year since 2014 that I know, there have been writers from um, uh, other linguistic parts of Africa who come in and uh, somehow Lola managed to make us all speak. <laughs> Thank you, Edwige. Um, so, the thing with Nigeria, um, I'm not sure how different it is here um, to, for instance, um, what obtains in, in Cote d'Ivoire, but we, we live in a, a hyper-religious society. Mm. Um, so because of that, you've got a lot of religious books. I mean, you, it's everybody and anybody seems to believe that they're, you know, qualified to write one as long as long as they're alluding to one of the um, Abrahamic, you know, the religious books. But um, I have to say that in recent years and perhaps over the last two decades, especially as more African writers have found some measure of success um, in the West, um, it's they people uh, in Nigeria become very, very eager and keen 
to read books that people in the in other parts of the world are reading, especially when that author is African. Mm -hmm. So because of that, um, and as a result of that, um, I think fiction is definitely giving uh, nonfiction a run for its money. Um, there are definitely, you know, more people who are seeking um, to become authors and find publishers, and we can tell you this because of the sheer number of manuscripts that we receive on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the book business is thriving. In many ways, it's still somewhat elitist because mm -hmm. books are still not as accessible as many of us um, would like them to be, but we continue to find ways to ensure that we can get books into people's hands. And I think that's something that, that the three of us have been quite devoted to over the last few decades. Yeah, thank you for that, because that is exactly one of the points that I wanted to go into, how you are all working into trying to bring books, and I would say not only books, but stories, literature also understood very, very broadly, to a wider audience, to people who may not make it to the bookshops or uh, may not have the, the capacity to buy many books and things like that. I found that was one of the interesting aspects when I was researching on all of you. And so I would like to ask now specifically about certain initiatives that you have started and really go specifically to each one of you. And I would love to start with Edwidge because you have uh, founded um, the, what is it called? 1949. Exactly, the, the, the library, 1949. Um, so it's a public library to commemorate the Ivorian women who in 1949 marched against colonial power. And to found a library dedicated to this is in itself um, a very wonderful thing. And I would love to hear more about this uh, library, um, how it works, what happens there, and what kind of people also come to the library? Well, uh, before the li library, actually, I co-founded uh, Abidjan Lee. Mm -hmm. um, and Abidjan Lee is basically to assert <clears throat> that Ivorian reads, because uh, the, yeah, the, the declaration of the statement was, oh, you know, Ivorians do not read or Africans do not read. And this was our way of saying, well, we do read. And so it was uh, every other month we would go into different um, places, into different neighborhoods of uh, Abidjan, in places where you are not expected maybe to be talking about books or fiction, I mean. So we go to co-working spaces, to a, a, a neighborhood shop, mm. um, and just organize um, a, you know, a, a reading, uh, discussion around a particular book and the particularity of that was um, anybody could take part in those sessions they did not need to like reading or to know how to read uh, because the context of Cote d'Ivoire is that at least you know 48 percent of the population uh, cannot read or write uh, French or mm -hmm. any of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, other languages here so um, we, we focus very much on the orality of, um, of literature. And then in 2020, I set up ES 1949, which uh, only houses books by African and black women. And, um, and, and the library is actually set up in um, quite a deprived neighborhood. So uh, we are the only library there. Um, and it was deliberate again to have it housed there in um, in, in, the, in that neighborhood to have um, people, you know, uh, mm -hmm. access this wonderful literature. You know, um, when you see people reading, um, you know, the, the the Secret Life of Baba Segui in French, when you you know you you see people reading writers that they wouldn't have had access to. Uh, yes, for that, that is, uh, for us, that is, uh, you know, that, that is wonderful. And the, the welcome, the welcome has been, has been wonderful because, you know, um, if we are open from Tuesday till, till Saturday mm -hmm. and people come in every day, uh, whether they are young students um, from uh, 14 
till about uh, 65. We have activities, again, reading activities, children book from everywhere in Africa, as long as you know they are translated in French, we will have it. And so we have readings for, for children age five, you know, five till eight. So, yes. Wonderful. We will get to the specific um, topic of literature for children and reading for children um, in a moment, because uh, that's one of the topics that I think um, we also want to discuss today, given that it is the United Nations Day of the African Child, 16th of June. But before that, I, I do want to just, again, just to give also, this is really just touching the surface of, of what the three of you do, just t picking and choosing here and there a few of the things to to discuss. And, and Lola, I would love to hear more. I mean, you, you run, first of all, the, the Ake Arts and Book Festival, which is considered as, as, as the... the the most, the biggest annual gathering, actually, of, of literary writers, editors, critics, and readers on the continent. But then you also do things like, like um, Infusion, a popular monthly gathering for music, art, and culture, or the Book Buzz Foundation, which is an NGO that you run um, for the promotion of arts and culture within local and global spaces. Can you tell us maybe something about these, these other uh, initiatives? I was going to say smaller, but I think smaller is not the word. They're just different initiatives. Yes, thank you. So it's been a bit of a journey. Um, and some of those concerns and some of those initiatives are ongoing. And some um, I kind of left in the specific spaces that I, in which they were founded. So I think the first, I mean, going back, my first... Um, uh, sort of journey into publishing happened when I was 23, when I founded my um, first publishing house called Ovo Onion. And I was inspired to do that after reading the- Did it make you cry? <laughs> <laughs> ha ha ha. <laughs> well, the thing is that in my 22, 23 year old mind, if you can imagine an onion, the way it looks, but it's oval. So to me, it looked like the shape of a woman's womb. Um, and uh, I was inspired by the women's press, um, which had published The Color Purple. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was really interesting to have a publishing house that published only women. Mm -hmm. um, but that didn't pan out. I guess I simply wasn't ready, um, as ready as I should be. Um, so over the years, um, I founded the Ibado Arts Renaissance in, I think, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2002. And what I tried to do, and I did the same, of course, with Infusion, is when I started an initiative in a particular space, when I leave, what I hope and talk about a lot before I leave is that other people, you know, take it over mm -hmm. so that after I've left that space, the initiative continues. But it's always nice to talk about that and hope that it happens. Um, I guess people don't realize just how hard the work um, that we sometimes have to do is. And, you know, once they get their teeth into it and they realize just how much of your personal resources and your time goes into creating these initiatives, they kind of, they often back out and things fizzle out. So I founded the Book Buzz Foundation in 2012, which was also my last year of teaching. So some of my background is actually um, secondary school teaching. I used mm. to teach English. Uh, drama and media studies taught in England and then um, was headhunted and started working as a deputy principal in Nigeria. And when I was going to leave after three years of holding that job, I wanted to create or establish something that brought together all the things that are important to me. So of course there's education, literacy and reading, and obviously just kind of culture and history. Mm. Um, so I founded the Book Buzz Foundation as a way <coughs> of being able to support schools, 
um, because that's very much, you know, that's what I was doing when I was a teacher. I was head of pastoral, but I was often all lumbered with the job of being head of literacy within the schools because I like to read and I'm slightly obsessed with kind of reading to children. It's something that I love to do. Um, so I founded the Book Bus Foundation and beyond supporting schools, the other important thing that I wanted to do was to found and start um, cultural events in mm -hmm. as many places as possible. And Ake Abel Kuta just happened to be, you know, the first one. We had our first edition of, the, of Ake Arts and Book Festival in 2013. And then by 2017, um, a state governor from northern Nigeria, which had previously seen its uh, fair share of violence um, from extreme religion, invited me to come and um, set up a similar festival in northern Nigeria, which I also did. Um, infusion was happening when I was in Abuja between 2009 and 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I really tried hard to get somebody to continue it. Um, but the good thing is that there are other initiatives. I've always believed in the power of um, showing what can be done and what the possibilities are. So often when I do start initiatives, it's because I have seen that perhaps people have strugg struggled to execute or implement um, their dreams and their aspirations for that initiative successfully. Mm -hmm. So sometimes where it's complicated to jump in and show them, I will just chart a new path and it will be like, hey, this, this way is easier. I often say that um, I have obstacle blindness. I really don't <laughs> see obstacles. I just believe that, especially on this continent, everything has to be powered through. You get what you want by fighting for it. And that's what I'm engaged in. I want culture, I want literacy, I want vast amounts of books everywhere for my people and for my country and for my continent. And that's what I've dedicated my life to so far. Thank you, Lola. Let me turn to Sukiswa, who also has a huge list of initiatives. I sometimes wonder how you are managing, uh, are you multiplying yourselves? And maybe this is a secret that you are keeping very well. But Sukizwa, on, of the many initiatives that I read about, three stuck out to me, and, and we don't necessarily have time for all three in detail, but I'm just going to mention them so that people know what's out there. You've got a series of online discussions, virtual gatherings, uh, exploring contemporary African literature with authors called Virtually Yours. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, a, an online platform for readers and writers to talk about African literature. So I definitely recommend looking into that. You've got Afrolit Sans Frontières, which is a, a virtual literary fast festival that you founded as a reaction to the pandemic and to the fact that people couldn't meet live. And you've got Afro Young Adult, so hashtag Afro Young Adult, a talent search for young adult fiction from Africa that you ran with the Goethe Institute. Can you tell us maybe more about Afro Lit Sans Frontier? I think this is what you created well, as a reaction. That was a reaction, but uh, it's, it's actually, it, it morphed into virtually yours. So it's, oh, nice. yeah, so yeah. it's, we had it for the pandemic, and then afterwards, what we decided to do, uh, why I decided to do with it, is um, we then became a, a, a virtual platform where, for an hour, I'll talk to a single, what you call it, and this this year it became more exciting because I have uh, Edwish doing the, um, doing the. We, we now have it in three languages: in mm. in, in Portuguese, in English, and and in French. So mm -hmm. uh, Edwish does the. Uh, French, um, Onjaki in uh, in Angola does uh, the Portuguese and and I do the English. So, yeah, there's that. But the Afro young adult thing was actually this. These women were very very involved with it as well because um, what we did um, the 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 Gute Institute uh, Sub Saharan had had actually asked that they wanted to do. Uh, they wanted to change their literature program for the longest time they'd been doing uh, literary crossroads. 
And uh, so they asked me for a suggestion, and I said, you know, we have the youngest grow, growing population on the, in the world, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, mm-hmm. Average age in Africa is 19.4 mm-hmm. years old. But there isn't, there, there is a lot of, you, you see a lot of children's books and you see a lot of uh, adult novels, but there was this gap that I, that I thought was missing. So I then had suggested to them that we, we do this thing and, um, and ask them how much their budget was. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, they were, they were you know, very forthcoming and, and kind. And so what we did is we um, did a call out in three languages. In, uh, we didn't do Portuguese in that because none of the Portuguese uh, speaking countries uh, at that point in time, had come on board. But what we did was we did we did English, we did French, and we did Kiswahili. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, and we did the callouts. And after the callouts, we got like maybe like four hundred and four hundred and at which how much four hundred and thirty about four hundred and thirty. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There. So we got about four hundred and thirty submissions. We had to sift through these submissions, and we selected uh, fifty six uh, people to take part in workshops in eight cities on the continent. Uh, Edwidge was facilitating in Lome. We had Dhaka. Mm-hmm. We had um, Dar es Salaam, uh, Tigali, uh, Joburg, uh, Nairobi, and uh, Accra, and Lagos. And uh, so eight cities. And uh, we did them all the same week, except for Lagos, uh, which delayed elections. And then... <laughs> Didn't even do them on the which had an election date and then then didn't even do them on the day that's supposed to have elections. <laughs> anyway, so so we um, and then from from the fifty six, you know, we thought that we'd get like a good ten twelve stories. We ended up having really uh, battling to select. We ended up having seventeen good stories. Uh, the stories that were written in English were translated into French and Kiswahili the French into Kiswahili and Mm -hmm. English. And then we had three anthologies. And the English anthology was published by Lawless uh, Widow Books. And the French uh, was published in in Dakar uh, by Amalion. And the the Kiswahili was published by E&D Publishers in in, uh, Dar es Salaam. So, yeah, and, and I think it's... The books have gone to over like uh, 28 countries. Mm -hmm. But one of the selection processes that we had is each of the institutes uh, had like an adult panel of judges and uh, to select the stories that would make it through into the anthology. But if I had like my own secret stash of people, I had like teenagers, <laughs> 13 to 18, and if the adults liked the story and the kids didn't like it, I didn't put it in the anthology. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Because they were the audience, mm. you know. Yeah, but yeah, that was, that was Afro Young Adult. And, uh, and, and, and Edwidge, of course, did uh, a lot of the English to French and then French to English translations mm. on that as well which has been an amazing, um, has shown amazing dialogue across, yeah. you know, across the continent in a way that yeah. was unimagined, I think, uh, maybe 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Can you give us the title of that anthology? It's called Water Birds on the Lake Shore. So, Water Birds on the Lake Shore, I think definitely something to go look out for. Um, let me move on precisely to the topic that you've just touched upon, Ed, um, sorry, Sakiswa, which is um, readers and young readers reading differently, and therefore this, this genre called young adult fiction being produced for them. And all of you are quite involved in that process as well. I mean, we've just heard about Edwidge translating all these uh, young adult um, stories. So, Kizwen Lola, you've both actually written for children and young adults. We've also published for what you call it. She's got the um, she's got the West African rights for uh, for an anthology called Story, Story, Story. Come with twelve oh, yeah. stories from 12 writers uh, from eight African countries. So she she published the West African and I did the Southern and East African. 
So you are covering this genre also oh, got very you got to cover it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be interested in knowing I mean you've already touched upon it a bit but hearing more about your specific interest in writing for these young adult audiences um what is it that that appeals to you um I mean you've mentioned already so but this this is also the age uh, of the continent, so to speak, in general, but are there other elements about the style of un young adult fiction, the topics, other things that attract all of you to this uh, genre? Well, I mean, I ultimately, I, I really just think I do adult fiction, but I like the idea of challenging myself as 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 a writer, as an artist, you know. So, I, I mean, when I did um, when I did uh, the the Mandela book. Uh, Black Pimpernel, it was really just, you know, people ask me to do things, people ask me to write something, mm -hmm. and I always feel because, you know, if somebody asked me to, um, to like, uh, draw, I, I don't know how to draw, so I won't do it, but if somebody asked me to write in a, you know, something that I haven't done before, I always feel that I should live up to the challenge as, as, as an artist, because mm -hmm. how do I call myself a writer if... I can't be able to be fluid with my writing. So, um, but I mean, obviously, I, I primarily think my, of myself as a novelist, mm -hmm. uh, an adult novelist. But um, what attracts me, obviously, is, um, you know, apart from the fact, so risk, uh, about last year, I, I, I got invited to something and they said it was an intergenerational conversation. Mm. And uh, and there was me, and there was this uh, young woman from South Africa, and uh, she is nineteen now, and and I was very hurt. I was like, "This is not intergenerational." I get her jokes, <laughs> and uh, but I realized the reason I got her jokes was because my son is about the same age, you know. <laughs> so, but that was only later on after I'd been offended, obviously. <laughs> but. Uh, so 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 in a way it's because you know I've got I've got I've got I've got a son and his friends and he loves reading mm -hmm. and and I notice like uh and, and and that's the thing where they're like oh this generation is not that generation reads a lot you know mm -hmm. I, I I remember I was in um I'm in the committee for the prom for my son and uh you know and 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 one of the students sent me a message you know a private message and he said I just wanted to say, and, and it put like one of my novels and it said, this book was amazing. Thank you so much. So I said to him, oh, okay. And I didn't realize because it's such a painful book. I mm. said, did you cry? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, I did. I said, okay. <laughs> I feel better about myself. <laughs> but, you know, but, uh, but, but kids are reading. And, mm. and so I think uh, even if they... Like uh, this young boy, Emmanuel, was, you know, he read my, my adult novel. But I want us to be able to, to, to ensure that seamlessly from childhood mm. up until as they go, that there is always something that they can read where they can identify themselves. I think we grew up reading like Enid Blyton, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there was nobody who looked like me in Enid Blyton, but, you know. Uh, so, so we'd say stuff like, I think when we started writing, we started saying stuff like, I felt the wind rushing through my hair. And you're like, Johnny <laughs> <laughs> now, you know? <laughs> or, are you blushing? And you're like, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> but over to you, <laughs> Lola. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that is so true. And every book I tried to read as well, oh, there was always a character called Michelle. <laughs> what? Even though I didn't really know any Michelles in real life. But yeah, um, but we were lucky. I mean, in, 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 in Nigeria, we also had access to the pace setters. I don't know if you... You had those in East Africa. I, I know that I said in Southern Africa, went. we did. You did as well, yeah. Mm. The pace setters, and then I now went full mills and boom by the time I was 12, where I did was reading the booms, you know, every day. The um, those romance novels, mm -hmm. uh, told um, I can so love it, you. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot of sex in my work. I, I, I still um, ascribe it to 
to my time as a Mills and Boone addict. So unlike Zuki, who's doing some incredible work in the young adult space, um, I think the most that I do is to publish young adult fiction when it comes my way. It was a wonderful collaboration um, that we did on both story story with the reimagined folk, folk tales, but also um, with Waterbirds as well. I mean, it was an excellent project and the book sold out um, mm. pretty quickly. Mm. So it's definitely worth looking at. So Kizwa did a wonderful um, job with that. So with us, like I said, we do mainly publishing of young adult fiction. Um, so this year, for instance, we're publishing Ruby Goka, who is a, 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 a Ghanaian author. And we have another uh, book coming out called All That I Ever Meant, uh, or All That It Ever Meant. Is that the I kissed, a, I kissed a Boy or whatever? Blessing Ruby. Musariri. No, I'm saying Ruby. Ruby wrote I oh, Kissed Ruby a Boy or something. Even when your voice, even when your voice shakes is okay. the one that we are publishing. Yeah. So my what I love doing is when Zukizwa recommends somebody to me, then I go and look at it and you know, and I'm happy to kind of go with her recommendations as to, you know, who's writing excellent YA fiction. But for me, um, creatively my focus has been on the much younger mm -hmm. um, children. So I'm writing for, you know, anything from three to, to, to 10. That's where I think uh, my skills are most useful. So now I'm working on um, something called the Northern Lights series, where I'm writing a book um, for every state in northern Nigeria, mm. just as a response to my visiting a school there a few years ago and discovering that there was so little color in the classroom, not only by way of well, a stark absence of, of school displays and, and resources, but also just an absence of books. So when uh, an NGO came to me with the with asking me what to do, and they had a bit of money, we put a hundred mobile libraries in a hundred schools in northern Nigeria. But I wanted to add something to that. Um, I wanted also to ensure that there was representation, mm. because in northern Nigeria we have ten million out of school children. And whenever it is that these kids encounter literacy or books, I want them to see themselves in those books. Mm -hmm. So the sort of books that I write for children are in, in some way, I, I don't even know if they're appropriate for the sensibilities of the Western reader, because I have been accused of being a bit you know, a bit hard in the sort of themes that I tackle. But mm -hmm. I'm also very confident that the children who are growing up um, in these parts can cope quite easily with those stories. But I want the central figures in, these, in this particular series to be children from very humble backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Because it is important, as Zukizwa said earlier, that when they do encounter books, they see themselves in those books. I'm not really concerned about middle-class children who have access to a raft of reading material anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so my, 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 the books that I write, full color, um, for me, I just want them to be funny because sometimes there just isn't enough humor in writing for very young children. I want those <coughs> books to to force the kids or at least to prompt the kids um, to ask their parents on uncomfortable questions. Um, so I'm hoping lots of that happens. And lastly, um, I just feel that when you see that your life or a life that, <clears throat> that is similar to yours, excuse me, is being taken seriously mm -hmm. to the point where a character that could be you is a protagonist um, in a book, what it does, it, it gives you a sense of self-worth. And I think that's going to be very important to those children in an age where the technological advancement is happening so quickly um, that I really worry if they even, um, if the opportunity for catching up 
actually exists at all. So that's kind of my focus mm. on the children's books. I'm, I'm writing 18 and I'm on number four. L- L- Lola, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry to, to interrupt yes, this yes, one, yes. but badly, badly, badly. Can you send me uh, the catalog for my libraries, please? I've been sure. asking you for it for those chill, for those books. You have, yes. and I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll, I'll get to that. I've so called. I've called her out in public. You yeah, saw. I, I was going to say that now you've been publicly called out to do this. Yes. <laughs> no. And I cover my my face in shame. <laughs> you have to do that. Kenya is good you for us. Let me move on to what I think will be my final question so that we can then also open for the audience to, to ask questions. And actually, this one will be first addressed to Edwidge because it has to do specifically with, with languages and, and, and translation and the choices we make about which languages to write and publish in. And therefore, it's also a question for all of you. But I would like to start with Edwidge's experience, because you also talked about that in the beginning, what languages are, are spoken in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and who speaks what language and what that has to do with accessibility. My question would be very general, first of all, Home do, if you write in a European language on the African continent, knowing of course that these are languages that still uh, are spoken very widely, but whom are you addressing when you choose to write in those languages or translate from one of those languages to another? And I'm thinking here of, I mean, it's an old debate and I would love to know where you feel this debate stands nowadays, but in the, what was it, the 70s, late 70s, 80s, Ngugi Wa Tiongo. Oh, he's still talking about that and right. he says it in English. <laughs> and he says it in English. <laughs> there was always that contradiction. <laughs> It was indeed always a very big contradiction that uh, the Kenyan writer Ngugi Wa Tiongo made this this very provocative statement and provoked this long debate that still goes on that uh, African writers should be writing in African languages and not in European languages. And he himself uh, writes primarily in Kikuyudo, then he translates himself into English. These things are complicated. But I would love to know, Edwidge, in your experience as a translator between these languages, English, French, what is your take on which language African authors choose to write in. What does that mean for what? What choice are they actually making? What is the statement behind it? Uh, I actually don't know. Um, for, I mean, for me, French is not a European language. Mm-hmm. You know, when I am speaking my French here in Cote d'Ivoire, I do not feel so ashamed. Uh, that I am speaking a European language because, you know what, I had not been to France until 2014 even. So, um, and also, um, it depends where you are, like in in Cote d'Ivoire here, French, so the French that is spoken in, 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 in France, le bon français, this is the official language. And then French also, the French that is Spoken in Cote d'Ivoire, the French that Ivorian have um, owned and appropriated for themselves is spoken by about 99% of the population, Mm -hmm. even those who do not know how to read and write are French. But it, you know, it is a French with its own uh, Mm -hmm. Ivorian um, Ivorian ways of of phrasing, uh, Ivorian ways of, you know, of of speaking, and some of those uh, words. Uh, have even made it into the Larousse dictionary. And then if you go to Senegal, then of course you will, you know, hear uh, Wolof being spoken so much. But it doesn't mean that the writers writing in Wolof are getting any bigger readership. I mean, Bubaka Boris Job uh, wrote in Wolof, but who is reading that book that he wrote? Uh, again, intellectuals, you know, so people who again can read and write. So it's not because you decide that, oh yes, I'm going to start writing in Yakuba. And therefore, people are going to be jumping on your book. But you need to be writing in a language that they can, they can um, feel close to. And I must say, this is what I actually like in uh, uh, a lot of the literature produced by um, some Nigerian writers. Mm-hmm. You know, they write in an English that you know will be spoken in Nigeria, you know, yeah. with the words that even 
we, as we speak English, we, we use it like, you know, things like Abe and who doesn't know Nepa and all of those things. We know because it has that, um, that particularity to it, that Senala uh, sauce. Since mm -hmm. we're speaking all the languages, Senala sauce. So, um, you, you know, for, so for me, it is not a case of uh, we need to write in an African language because I do consider that uh, when I write in French, I am writing in my language. Who is going to take that away from me? Yeah, thank you for that, Edwidge. Lola? I, I totally agree with, with Edwidge, how beautifully articulated. So my novel is, in, is written in English, but the truth is everybody who reads it, well, a lot of people who read it tell me that they are fooled and deceived into thinking that they're actually reading in Yoruba. And that's because all my thoughts um, and the planning and the crafting of the sentences, um, a lot of the time were direct translations from Yoruba. We're all victims of our colonial past, but the truth is that when it comes to language, especially in a country like Nigeria, where we have almost 400 languages, um, English is a vehicle. <coughs> for communication. And the truth is, this English is our English. Mm. We speak it how we want it. We twist it, we bend it, we recreate it. We present it any way we like. And like Edwish said, nobody, absolutely nobody um, can take that away from us. And that's speaking from the perspective of a writer who seeks to reach as wide and as broad an audience as possible. As a publisher, um, I totally, um, I am emotionally aligned with Ngugi Wa um, I, I res very much respect his views, um, not just as a person, but, but as an African intellectual who blazed the trail for, for many of us, and we are here because they are here. However, we're living in a world, I think, where Production is driven by demand. Edwige made reference earlier to the literacy rates in mm. her country. Mm. I'm sure that in Nigeria, in terms of the number of people who can actually speak, uh, who can write and read in their indigenous language, the number is going to be much smaller. Mm -hmm. So therefore, publishing in an indigenous language sometimes can just come across as a novelty, you know, something that you do because it feels good. And of course, it looks good and everybody's happy. But how much they will engage with that text mm -hmm. as, um, you know, as a, as a work of art, I don't know, because I think more people will more readily um, engage with, an, with the English language text, which um, which is, you know, that that is what most people around you, both in, you know, in Nigeria, in other pa parts of Africa, that's what many people are reading. So we do not have the luck that Z Z Zukizwa, for instance, um, has where she's operating, where, you know, Kiswahili, some of those languages mm -hmm. are the lingua franca, mm -hmm. you know, in, in those regions, we just don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to do what works for our market, but also doing such a very difficult job as it is with publishing, we've got to at least publish in a language that means that we can, you know, get our returns as quickly as possible. Thank you. So, Kiswa? Um, yeah, um, you know. We've got we've got a Nigerian and an Ivorian and somebody who was born in Angola, and we're able to understand each other because we're speaking English. Mm. You know, I think that says it all. The point of, um, you know, the point of um, language is to communicate. You know, so if you aren't able to communicate, then um, you have perhaps failed. But also, it occurs to me that it's only in literature uh, where um, you know, the artists, we try to tell the artists what colors they must use on their palette. We don't tell that to, to a visual artist. We don't tell that to a musician what they should play, you know. Um, however, like Lola, I do sympathize as a publisher. And 
And, and so one of the things that I did as, um, as a publisher, really, uh, the anthology that she and I did, uh, Story, Story, Story Come, because of children. And, and I was very, 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 it was very deliberate because I understood uh, I didn't want this book to only be to children who spoke English, you know, because a lot of children, when they're younger, they speak their mother tongue. So I wanted these stories to go to them. And so I have done, uh, well, that anthology, I've done, a, there's, there's a Kosa translation, which is uh, my dad's language. There's a Shona translation, which is my mom's language. There's a Chivenda translation, uh, which is spoken in northern part of South Africa. And there's a Kiswahili translation, you know, and um, like my whole idea is I would, I'd, I'd really like to be able to do like, you know, like do a French translation so that I can have it, I can have a Lingala translation, you know, that type of thing. Because I, I want as many children to have access to these stories and see themselves because I think they're really, really beautiful. Um, the adults generally, I think uh, they can they can take care of, of themselves and... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a country that has, um, you know, 11 official languages in South Africa, mm -hmm. uh, but I stay in a country that has 42 languages, Kenya, which is um, Gugi's country. Uh, if I decided that I was going to write in Iskosa, it means I'm not even communicating to, yeah. to, to, to other, other South Africans, you know, oh. even more than the rest of the continent. And I... You know, and I want to communicate. I want them to hear what I'm saying. You know, if if I'm writing, like I was saying yesterday, if I'm writing nonsense about the British, I want them to read it. <laughs> you know, if they don't, if they don't read uh, Kosa, then I failed in communicating mm -hmm. that day, hey, guys. Your colonial things, eh? You know, I failed if mm -hmm. I write it in Shona or Kosa. You know, so um, yeah, I think uh, if the object of a language is to communicate, then mm. I think we're doing pretty well. And our ancestors were killed for those languages, so they are ours. Thank you. I think this is, this is the final word. <laughs> for the moment, thank you so much. Thank our you for ancestors this. were killed. I love that. <laughs> it's not mine, it's Amata Idus. <laughs> Thank you for opening this amazing space for us. I think we have a few minutes for some questions and it would be wonderful if you added your voices. Um, thank you very much for this brilliant uh, presentation. I must say I'm quite impressed with the work that you guys are doing. Um, I was going to ask about the language, but you answered me already. <laughs> um, but I want to ask a related question, and it has to do with um, working, um, working with, say, uh, European NGOs. Mm -hmm. um, one short answer could be monetary reasons. We want resources. Without resources, nothing can move. Mm. But how do you guys go around the obstacles of working with an agenda set by other people? Mm. Uh, for instance, I could say, just because there is so much talk about climate change and the EU mm. is able to sponsor uh, that direction, everyone is writing about uh, climate change. I think um, if it was not... Um, uh, Mamanda, at some point, she talked about um, African writers not being able to write about easy things without aiming to write about uh, development and, and poverty in the end, even if it's a fictional work, because they're trying to cater for a certain audience. Certain Whoever audience. said that is not reading enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they are not reading. Yeah, whoever said that is not reading enough uh, literature from Africa. We have everything from crime fiction to science fiction to, you know, fantasy fiction to uh, so-called um, chick lit, and I call it so-called because there isn't dick lit, um, and so forth and so on. Um, so um, I, um, 
that statement, I think when people say that, they're not reading enough. But uh, regarding working with, uh, with, with, with Western NGOs, if you will, I think if you decide, you decide what it is that, uh, how you're going to work with people. All our countries, and, and you know this, all our countries have a uh, department of arts and cultures, you know. Uh, none of us uh, know what happens with those, with the funding for arts and culture. In 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 a lot of African countries, I think uh, the Gute Institute and uh, to some extent Pro Heveltia and 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 Alliance are a de jure uh, Ministry of Arts and Cultures because our governments are not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, that said. Um, it, it, it then becomes on you on whether how much of yourself you can give. So personally, I don't uh, work with any institute that doesn't give me full artistic control. I, and I think it's the same with uh, uh, these uh, ladies, because I know uh, all three of us have said no to doing things where they there's somebody wants to pour money and you're like, yeah, but when you pour, uh, yeah, but you know, you need to do this and this and we've said no. So um, that artistic integrity is very important. Yep. Um, I'm totally aligned with, with Zuki. Um, if, uh, if we have common goals with a European entity, um, I'm very, very happy to, to work with them. Um, but generally, I will decide I have to have um, the, the beginning, middle and final say on, on what we actually um, um, do. And of course, it's my vision a lot of the time that is being um, um, pushed. So it's important that I have um, that level of artistic control. Uh, I'm sure you can hear that I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, <laughs> not um, I should you also say that it's not know. fair. <laughs> it's not fair to say that our <laughs> that our governments uh, don't do much. I personally receive an invitation every year from the Ministry of Arts and Culture encouraging me to attend a book festival in Sudan. But the, the funny thing about that, um, that invitation is that it, it always happens at the same time as Aki Festival. You, so you, are, keep... you are very lucky with your government. You are very yeah, lucky you with your government. Our, our Minister of Arts and Culture, do you know what we call him? We call him what? minister. We call him minister of congratulations and condolences because that's all he does. When an artist dies, it's like ah. Uh, when an artist wins an award, congratulations, as if he had something to do with it. When an artist dies, oh, condolences. We've lost a great artist. That's why we call him. That's why so we call you're him. You're jealous. You're jealous of this. My invitation. <laughs> the ah, no. Who do you know? <laughs> Who do you know? <laughs> okay. And, and, and didn't, your, didn't your Minister of Arts and Culture go and open up, like, what did they do at Wish? <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. What, and, you know, like, to, I mean, you know, uh, agenda set by other people. I would rather work with people who have an agenda than people who have no agenda. <laughs> my ministry of culture, maybe we have changed. Maybe they have changed, we will know. But they'll tell you, you know, you want transparency into this thing. And I also think just to really get into uh, ourselves, the three of us here and like, you know, we are phenomenal people. It is because we are doing something that people are coming to us. So, and we, I really do not think that you can impose anything on, on, on Lola and say, you know, go here and go there and go there. She'll just tell you no. She'll just tell you no. So it's because we're doing something. And if it aligns, if it aligns with our mission, with our visions, with our goals, of course we will do it because we need money to make, uh, you know, the things that we do. Uh, but if it does not align, we will say no. We will say no. I think Which it's important at this time that I say that in Nigeria, I have had considerable success with raising funding locally. Mm -hmm. So Sterling Bank 
yeah, funds it's been a amazing. lot of the creative work that we do in Nigeria. And it feels so good to be able to have these local organizations and entities supporting the work that we do. So from almost being totally reliant on international agencies, we've kind of come to a like a 40, 60 uh, percent kind of arrangement, 60 being the bank Sterling that supports bank. us. So that's, that's, it's pretty incredible. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Uh, there would be time for more questions. If anybody would like to add. Thank you very much, too. Um, I was wondering if the books you're publishing are available also in Europe or here in Switzerland, or if it is uh, important to you, or if it's not very much uh, in the foreground of your activities. Lola? <laughs> yeah, some of our books are available on Amazon, um, but anybody who knows anything about the history mm -hmm. of publishing on the African continent understands that um, although we had a lot of the big names, the big publishers in, in Nigeria, for instance, in the 60s, when um, the military governments or military regimes came into play and kind of chased away most of our intellectuals, um, the, the, the um, publishing houses and printers, a lot of them just left and went into exile and never came back. Um, so what a lot of us have been doing, those of us who are printing and publishing now, um, is trying to basically create and find new silk roads um, mm -hmm. that make it easier for us um, to do business where we don't always feel that we are the ones having to um, kind of bear the brunt of the, the, sh the difficulties that we have on the African continent. I mean, vis-a-vis -vis Europe um, in, in distribution mm -hmm. um, and shipping and all mm -hmm. that. So um, we do try. So every time I travel, I am like a forever book, book mule. I take a lot of the books and then I have one of my children whose job it is to, to ship them on Amazon. So it's a family business, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she's being real. <laughs> you know how it is now. We have to tell the, the truth. When I don't have any, they will say, where's your structure? Where's your structure? <laughs> But if I may add to that, what I find interesting about the discussion we're having, and I've had this feeling from the beginning, and now it's confirmed by this um, shipment difficulty, is that we're talking about a wonderfully independent Pan-African um, market here or, or kind of a route mm. or series of routes that are being formed. And that is extremely exciting in terms of, of the, 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 um, the independence that was always kind of fought for so, so heavily on the African continent. And so to actually achieve a market that operates the way also the three of you and many other people around you work together, exchange information, books, authors, whatever, this is in effect a great success that, that you don't have to rely also on, on providing books for the, the so-called Western markets, that you are doing it for yourselves and with each other, that is independence, after all. Absolutely. I mean, I, of course, I, I think every publisher would love to mm. have uh, their books worldwide, you know. But um, sometimes it's not, it's, it's not cost effective, you know. If you're coming through and yeah. you only have, like, uh, two suitcases, baggage allowance, you know, <laughs> and uh, it, it's going to be hectic. But one of the things that I've been trying to do personally with with uh, Europe is um, 
uh, I was talking to Zoe Beck, who was a good friend of mine, and just getting, um, getting, uh, and it's something that I've done with Lola, you know, in, uh, in, 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 in Nigeria, where I just, you know, get a quotation from, from a printer in that country, and then I, um, I send the PDF, it gets printed in that country, mm -hmm. so that, you know, it cuts on, on all the other costs that I have to deal with, yeah. you know, and now that, um, the euro is not as powerful. Maybe there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Zuki, by the way, has has done. She mentioned Book Fam Africa in passing, mm -hmm. and I think uh, a big part of the connections that are being made um, between publishers in North Africa to South Africa to West Africa to East Africa have come about as a result of that incredible platform um, that, that she created and invited us all to join. Um, this idea of even being able to get books around Africa, I think for many of us, that's our big focus right now. Mm -hmm. We want to get our people reading. We want our people to have access to our books. We know how important our stories are to one another on the African continent. So the idea of those books being available in the West, it's lovely and it's something that one might aspire to, but I don't it's think not, it's yeah. something that we're prioritizing. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Given the time and the heat in this room, I think we will have to wrap up this discussion, though I have the feeling that there would be plenty more questions that uh, we could ask. All three of you, thank you so much, Edwige, Lola, and uh, Suskiva, for lovely this amazing conversation, for sharing so much of your experience and knowledge uh, and opinions with us. Uh, thank you to the audience for staying here so focused in spite of the heat. I wish you all a lovely evening. Thank you. What is the heat there? What is the temperature? We are talking about you. You know, you're here like 18.